Good morning, everybody. Uh, my name is Dana Chadwick. I am currently a postdoc at Stanford University, and I um, have both in my dissertation work and now my postdoc been working with um, the types of sensor packages that are associated with the AOP. Um, so I worked with the Global Airborne Observatory uh, quite extensively, and then now I'm working um, with some data from the NEON AOP that was collected as part of an assignable assets project in Colorado. Um, I have a decent amount of experience ground truthing and trying to generate products from, um, especially foliar trait maps, from um, imaging spectroscopy data. But uh, what I was asked to do today is to kind of give you an overview of um, different types of applications. Um, no problem. <laughs> um, different types of applications uh, for imaging spectroscopy data in particular. And then I know Jeff is going to follow up after this and talk about LIDAR more specifically. So I'm going to try not to you know, encroach <laughs> on his territory here. Um, <laughs> but you know, the sensors are integrated, so there's you know, kind of some associated um, uh, things that happen. I was thinking that I would try to do this kind of in a similar way to Tristan. Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to kind of take you through a set of different um, kind of different products that people have developed through kind of, um, some different case studies and pulling from you know different projects that will result in in the same types of data. Um, and then I'm I, so I'm going to I mean. I can, I can get going here in a second, but I'm going to kind of take you through some examples and then also ways of scaling those products, both through space and through time, and to think about kind of other ecological and critical zone inference that we can potentially start to gather um, from using these types of data. So it's going to kind of be wide ranging, and if I would love it if you guys want to interrupt me and ask about methods, I'm kind of trying to keep it relatively high level to get through some different examples. But if there's things that people want to stop and talk about, I'm like, very happy to do that. Um, and this is uh, just a um, kind of the red, green, blue image from the spectrometer in um, Crested Butte in Colorado. And this is overlaying on kind of just a, the digital surface elevation model at about one meter. And just to give you a sense, if we take some just um, principal component analyses of these data, we start to be able to see a lot more information that, um, about the reflectance characteristics of the vegetation across landscapes. And so this is just kind of an example of um, how much more information you can, you can start to see when we look at these data in different types of ways. So this part will be very brief, because Tristan did an amazing job yesterday of introducing all of us to this. But um, this is uh, the AOP on the far side. And for the imaging spectrometer, it is a passive sensor, which means that it's getting the light that it's, um, that it's observing from the sun. It's reflecting and interacting with the land surface here and being collected by the spectrometer, um, which is here. The gold one is the spectrometer. The one on the right is how you store all that information. I'm already dropping things. So we're on it now to a good start. Um, and then I'm primarily going to be talking about um, things that you can derive from the reflectance data. And the reflectance data has already gone through atmospheric correction um, from radiance. And you'll notice that in these images, I'm going to kind of be showing gaps in these data associated with the atmospheric interference rather than kind of um, having those uh, data spikes that we were seeing yesterday. Um, so, what can we learn about the surface, like vegetation surface, from these types of data? So, I'm going to talk about um, identifying species, um, mapping foliar traits such as um, like nitrogen composition, leaf mass per area, um, some different things like that, and then also thinking about vegetation water content and um, how changes in vegetation water content can help us understand ecosystem responses to things like drought. For each of these, I'm going to first kind of show you a picture of what I mean. I'm going to talk about how you end up with these data products, and then why. So like, what are some projects that have used these types of data before? Um, and I've been trying to pull from kind of human environment interactions when I can. Um, there's, you know, there's a lot of projects that are kind of more explicitly ecologically focused, but I'm trying to um, pull from some that might be interesting to this group in particular. So, and then. Um, 
I'm going to talk a little bit, because this was definitely of interest yesterday, about expanding um, the AOP inference. So these are your, you know, the particular sites that Tristan mentioned. You, these are the terrestrial ones. I'm biased. I apologize. Um, and you know, so this is an example of a flight line that might exist across a particular area. But what happens when we want to expand across space? What happens when we want to expand through time? Or what happens when we want to maybe understand something about the subsurface? So to get started, um, I'm going to talk first about species mapping. This is a map from work that was done by Emily Francis, um, who's a grad student at Stanford. And um, she did a bunch of work looking at mapping redwood distributions in Marin. And so what you see here in blue are um, the locations of um, redwood trees across this landscape. And there's a lot of different things that, um, a lot of different reasons that people are interested in the particular location of a given species across landscapes. And how you would start to develop these maps would be by um, collecting really sufficient ground data so that you can build models using these spectral data. So um, where you would start is by going out into the field and um, collecting GPS locations. This is, um, oh, I'm sorry, this is cut off. This is from, oh, uh, there's another one on this side. This image is from Fricker et al. in Remote Sensing 2019, um, where they did, I'm, I'm actually not sure if they took your data or if they collected their own data, but these are um, ground points where they have identified the species of these trees and delineated the crowns associated with them. Um, it's their data. Our airborne data. Your airborne data, yeah, exactly, but, but their ground data, okay. Um, and so in order to be able to generate kind of more spatially extensive maps of these, you need really good ground truth data, and you need kind of the spatial extent of each of those crowns. And those data can be challenging to come by because sometimes there is displacement between a GPS point that you might take, depending on the quality of your GPS, and a crown. These crowns are kind of nicely spaced, but if you can imagine in kind of more closed canopy forest, that can be tricky. Um, and so uh, in my work, I've actually taken um, these types of imagery out to the field in like a, a field tablet and actually delineated particular crowns in the field where you can kind of walk around the crown and gain confidence that you're looking at the correct, um, the correct individual in the image, um, which you know, once you then take back to the lab and you have all of your awesome data that Tristan has processed for you, you can extract um, the spectral information associated with each of those species and have this um, kind of categorical understanding of what these spectra are associated with. So this is an example from a different paper, which is using the same method um, by Turin. And what you can see here is that, you know, so this is a set of um, different um, both, I think, conifer and broadleaf in California. And um, you can, you know, even by eye, tell that there's differences between the kind of the average spectra of these different species. They start to separate fairly well here. Um, and so when you have these kind of combi these combined data, you can take that categorical species information, you can take these spectral reflectance data. And a lot of times people have used support vector machines um, is the type of um, statistical method people use. There's a lot of other methods that people are kind of working on developing. This is just an example. Um, and then you can map these species across space. So this is an example where they've actually, um, instead of just a single species, mapped a whole series as well as um, trees that are dead. Yeah, go ahead. Right now, this is quite site-specific, um, though because of the NEON AOP work and the fact that they're trying to kind of develop a library across multiple sites, ideally, ideally these things will become generalizable. Um, but for a variety of reasons, uh, spectral data across spectrometers can end up looking different. There's different atmospheric correction algorithms. There's lots of different things that can kind of play into why spectral information might look different from different sensors at different times. And so um, there, ideally, you will eventually get a large enough database that you could use that um, kind of outside a given area that's parameterized. But right now, it's usually like kind of a case by case. I guess I'm thinking about the, um, the spectral work in the aquatic world for characterizing spectra. Similar type of data set 
within species variability within the particular flight line or whatever, like if one's being shaded by a taller tree or it's in a wet spot, anything like that, what's yeah. their accuracy in that? So that's a really good question about shading. Um, one thing that we have traditionally done in Greg's program, the Global Airborne Observatory program, is to develop um, shade maps to remove shaded pixels because um, the reflectance associated with shaded versus unshaded can be very different and cause a lot of kind of chaos, <laughs> um, for lack of a more um, nuanced term. And so what they've done is to build, it's just basically a geometry um, calculation using the LIDAR data to estimate where in the crown or in the landscape would have been shaded at that time because you have the exact GPS, like time and location, of each flight, you have the surface geometry, you know where the sun was on that exact day at that exact place on the planet, and so you can kind of back out those calculations. Even excluding like the north side of the tree, if it's mm -hmm. like Yeah. Um, and it depends on the resolution of your LIDAR how well that works, but um, so you do have some intra canopy shading that will certainly come into it, but generally it, it masks out the, the most shaded pixels. And that's something that we've been working on is to um, develop kind of independently associated with a Crested Butte project. And hopefully, we're going to actually be releasing code for other people to be doing that in the future as well. So um, uh, you can also use brightness thresholds for that. So if, you're, if the total reflectance, so if you're shaded, the, basically the whole reflectance spectrum will be kind of downshifted. There's just less brightness. Um, there's also kind of warping that happens. It's not like an even downshift, so which makes it hard to just normalize. But um, you can you can kind of use that decrease in brightness to also remove some of those things. Um, um, and the accuracy of these, you know, I I would be lying if I told you I memorized the accuracy numbers from this, but <laughs> I think they they tend to be pretty high. Um, they tend to have like a true positive rate of, I th I'm thinking about the next example, I think it's around 90%. And then, um, uh, yeah, so it, you know, and, there, and there's lots of different ways for kind of optimizing that because when you're doing a categorical estimation, you decide on a threshold, you know, of like where do you wanna like cut, cut off to say, okay, yes, this is definitely the species. So there's a lot of tweaking for individual studies that goes on still. Sorry, that was a long-winded no, answer, that's okay. Quite good. Okay. Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, I'm sure not always, but you know. Um, okay, and so then um, I'm going to tell you about kind of an example of someone that uh, used these types of data for this. So, this is a study that was done by Becky Nemec, who's now at uh, CSU. And um, she was looking at um, mapping Albizia in Hawaii. Albizia is this tree over here. It's invasive to Hawaii. Um, and there's been kind of efforts to try to understand and control um, the distribution of it. Um, it's mapped out in red here. And um, while the, the primary controls in this distribution were environmental, so elevation, it tended to be closer to the coast, there, you know, there's some general constraints on its range. When they looked at this kind of um, subdivision in particular, where some of those things were controlled, and they were able to take um, information about all of the parcels in that area from tax records and look at kind of social economic factors that were driving um, the occurrence of this invasive. And what they found, I'm going to show you on this kind of 2D partial dependency plot here, uh, was that, um, so how this works is um, you're seeing kind of the response, so the presence, absence of albizia. Um, based on these kind of axes here, so property size and building value, um, holding everything else constant. So you're kind of seeing the, the particular effects of these things. And so what you see is that property size doesn't really seem to have an effect, but the building value does seem to have an effect. So as your building values increase, your incidence of invasion tends to go down. The building value 
um, being lower often has been associated with um, absenteeism on some of those properties and things like that. So I, this is a cool example that I thought might be interesting to this group for um, some ways of kind of intersecting um, individual plot level or parcel level information with kind of environmental invasion that's happening. Mm -hmm. This is on this part of Hawaii. Um, <laughs> uh, <laughs> yeah, the <laughs> this square is where it is. Um, I think it might be in Puna. Yeah. Sorry, I, <laughs> it's not my work, <laughs> but. Um, um, all right, so these are some examples of species mapping. So now I'm going to talk to you about um, trait mapping. And so this is from a project that I am actually working on. Um, this is Mount Kinabalu in Borneo. And um, here we've been um, collected a whole series of samples so that we could um, understand how traits uh, are distributed across a variety of different types of landscapes. Um, so Did in this case, yeah, so yeah, in this case, this is a false color image, and the red is like leaf mass per area. And so leaf mass per area is kind of a, a rough indicator of kind of the investment of a plant in um, making their leaves more resistant to um, herbivory or other things. Um, and when there tends to be kind of a dynamic where you think of low leaf mass per area are species that grow fast and have kind of expendable leaves, they turn them over pretty quickly. And then, um, and then kind of the opposite. So it's uh, kind of indicative of a life strategy, like a, almost like a KR life strategy. If that's a thing that makes more sense. Um, so leaf mass per area. And then um, in this case, uh, it's red, green. Green is uh, foliar phosphorus concentration, and blue is foliar calcium concentration. But also we've looked at nitrogen. Um, people will look at lignin, tannins, a variety of different kind of chemical composition of the leaves. And so I'm going to give you an example of how you go about doing this. Um, this is an example from a different place, but that's OK. Um, so again, um, when you're trying to do this type of work, you have to have very good geolocation data. So you have to know where the crowns are that you're interested in. Um, and then we're actually sampling from the sunlit leaves at the tops of these trees. So this is um, also work that was done by the, uh, sorry, um, by uh, me and uh, Greg's group um, working with some of their awesome tree climbers and botanists. And they climbed to the top of each of these trees and collected um, samples that are basically um, coincident with what the sensor would be seeing. And this was all done within like three weeks of the sensor overflight at this location. Um, and so to do this, you, you take these leaf samples, you take them back to the lab, you stabilize them, you dry them, and then you do a bunch of chemical analyses on them. Um, so there's a bunch of work that's involved with this. Um, the GPS locating took out um, differential GPS. And then um, in this case, people worked on doing the crown delineation after the fact. Um, more recently, at some work in Kinabalu, we were trying to do crown delineation in the field, actually, which we found to be a bit easier to deal with. And then um, you can extract the spectral information um, from those images that are associated with those particular crowns. <laughs> oh no, <laughs> this, is, <laughs> this is where it gets contentious. Okay, go ahead. Yeah. Did you factor in the field of the wet leaves also? No, no. Um, so people have done that, and um, one of the th challenges associated with that is that leaf level spectra don't have any of kind of the canopy, like transmittance and re reflectance, or structural components or anything like that. and. The way that people do that is by doing um, radiative transfer modeling. So actually trying to model a canopy and how light like actually interacts with that canopy. And then what you kind of either forward or inverse modeling of that. So either what, given a leaf spectra, you would expect to see at the canopy level, or what you see from the canopy level, what you would expect the leaf spectra to be. 
but that is like a, a whole research area unto itself. And so using this process, we've kind of tried to bypass that step using statistics. Um, and so instead of trying to model and understand canopy structure in a really diverse canopy system, especially like thinking instead, OK, so these are the spectra. Let's try to relate them directly with what we see on the ground. So. Mm -hmm. You were saying that, so uh, partly because of what you just explained, you were taking the least spectra by climbing the trees. But then you said something that didn't mm. relate back to the lab? Or? So yeah, we actually weren't, it was just collecting samples from the top. So oh, not, okay, not the spectra. It. Yeah, so, so it's just to like take them back and identify the species, calculate leaf mass per area, water content, and then dry them down and take them back to the lab for chemical analyses. Oh, okay. Sorry, did I go off in the wrong direction there? So um, where did you take the um, spectral data to leave? Sorry. Oh, so this was from um, the Carnegie Airborne Observatory at the time, now the Global Airborne Observatory flew <laughs> over this site. Oh. And so it's airborne spectra. So it's analogous to the AOP. So this is like AOP spectra that we're dealing with oh, so here. There's no field spectra. There's no oh, field spectra okay. at all. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And, and maybe we're lazy, but we just use it. We don't climb it. We just use it. <laughs> so my question was how long the pigments in the biochemistry the leaves stay fresh for that kind of spectroscopy? Well, so yeah. So you keep so when you when you collect them in the field, you try it. So there's a set that if you're doing kind of bulk elemental analysis, yeah, they just get dried at yeah. like 60, 70 degrees. And then if you want to do things like phenols and tannins and chlorophylls, um, you flash freeze them in liquid nitrogen. So we keep them like in a cooler in the field, take them back to the lab punch out a bunch of them and store them in liquid nitrogen until we can get them back to like a minus 80 and then do analyses that okay. way. So, um, so yeah. And the, I, I guess I don't know what they're called anymore, but the spectronomics group has like a lot of details on how they do that field work. Um, and then there's different ways that you do it now. So, and, and you guys have lots of documentation on this too, I think, yeah, right? I mean, yeah, the they do that too. Um, which is, yeah, collected, you know, again, independent of the, of the, you know, it's associated with the AOP team, but not, not independent of that team. Yeah, I mean, one of the, the, the uh, biggest drivers of our schedule is the Boyer sampling protocol. So we make sure we are always overlapped with the Boyer sampling because that's the most crucial link for us to a field data product. You're always flying the same site in the same year. Right, and you're kind of within like a it's window of that to be time. Within two weeks. Mm -hmm. Logistically, it's not always possible, yeah. but that's the intent. Yeah. Did you have a question? Okay. <laughs> okay. Um, so in this case, um, we've generally used an iterative um, kind of cross validation PL partial least squares regression method. Um, a lot of people are working on developing other types of methods that you could use. Again, like the exact kind of statistical methodologies, I feel like, are often in flux. Um, but this allows us to kind of come up with a set of coefficients that then you can directly apply across the, um, the spectrum. And again, this would be filtered to remove shaded pixels, to remove non-vegetated pixels. So you're predicting only on pixels that, that make sense to, to do this type of work. And so you know, this is a... Um, this is what, uh, an area of imagery, and what you can what you do is you then transition from that green surface into this is now a map of foliar nitrogen concentrations, um, and uh, you know just to give you a sense, like this area, if you assume a 30 meter canopy um, diameter, is roughly equivalent to sampling 50,000 trees. So um, you know, th just these types of data give you a lot more uh, information across space. Um, so now I'm going to kind of transition to an example of how you might use these data. I'm going to be featuring some work by Elsa Ordway, who's here. Um, <laughs> so she's um, 
Uh, you can also uh, talk to her later if I butcher this, but she's looking at um, basically edge effects in um, Malaysian Borneo. And so there's been a lot of transformation to oil palm um, in this region. And there's, um, so there's kind of a lot of fragmentation of these landscapes. And I believe her work was at least partially motivated by this finding um, from 2017 that about 20% of remaining tropical forests are within 100 meters of a forest edge. And so what effect is that having on kind of the composition of these forests? Um, and so this work is done in Malaysia and Borneo. And she um, kind of identified edge sites all over the place in different types of forests. And um, her general results were are that um, you see, so this is um, kind of the extent of an effect of the edge for each of these characteristics, and um, and then the magnitude of those effects. And so, like for example, above ground carbon is decreased by about twenty percent, um, and then to into about let's call that about 80, 80 meters in. Um, to the forest on kind of as a as average or median or something here. The median average is 100, great. Um, the above ground carbon, I'm, I'm veering into Jeff's territory a tiny bit here, but, um, <laughs> uh, but you can also see the effect on um, other leaf traits. And the other leaf traits seem to not be affected quite as far into these forests. Um, but have different types of effects. So you have kind of a, a decrease in leaf mass per area, increase in foliar phosphorus concentration, things like that. And you could speculate about kind of disturbance effects and like early successional species that have these types of um, shifts in leaf mass per area or foliar nutrients. You could potentially think about the effect of fertilization might have on foliar phosphorus concentration, things like that. So um, this is some really interesting work that she's doing. So stay tuned for more results on that front. Um, are you happy with that characterization? Sure. Great. Um, <laughs> um, cool. And so then, how am I doing? Am I like a thousand times over? I am. Um, OK. What do you want me to do? <laughs> <laughs> uh, so I can. So I was going to talk about, just briefly, I was going to talk about kind of thinking about subsurface inference, what kind of collections you need to do to that expanding across space and expanding across time. And I think maybe the space and time are more interesting for folks. Should I like zoom to that or should I pause and come back to this later and turn it over to Jeff? OK, cool. Well, do you guys want to keep going? Do you want to break? OK. Um, <laughs> give you the option to opt out. Um, OK, then we're going to go lightning fast through my, um, my deeper one here. So this was, uh, you, you'll, you'll just you know infer what I was going to say about this. Um, <laughs> OK, moving on. Um, <laughs> that was the critical zone piece, so we can talk about that later. <laughs> um, so um, the other thing that we can start to do with these types of data is think about canopy water content. And um, so this is kind of from the same area in California that I was showing you before. And um, this is kind of the red, green, blue, again, um, overlaid on, a, on the topography. And we can um, start to actually map basically the vertically integrated um, canopy water content, so the amount of liquid water associated with vegetation. Um, the way that this is done, um, this is not currently an output project product from the NEON AOP. It is an output product from different types of atmospheric correction algorithms. Um, it's basically solved for because, so this red line is radiance. Um, and then the green is derived canopy reflectance. And part of how that process works is that it estimates um, the amount of atmospheric water vapor and the amount of um, canopy water content. And by solving for those two simultaneously, it helps to kind of um, make these corrections. Um, and so ATCOR does not produce that, but ATRIM and ACORN do, um, as well as I think optimal estimation will uh, there's just a bunch of different types of ways you can do these atmospheric corrections. I would say ACOR uses that technique, but doesn't, doesn't output it. Really yeah, yeah. Um, and so then what you get is this estimate of kind of liters per meter square of canopy water. And part of the reason you might do this is to look at the changes in canopy water content, for example. 
This is not the best figure for this screen, um, but this is from the California drought, looking at basically changes in canopy water content that happened, and the kind of the proportional drivers of those. And um, the interesting thing about canopy water content is because it's this vertically integrated um, estimate of uh, water, you're seeing both changes in leaf water content, but also in LAI. So as different species do LAI shedding relative to kind of reduction in leaf water, that um, you can still kind of estimate stress from those things. Um, so this is when we're going to get to some scaling work that was done associated with this. Um, so in California, the Greg Asner's group um, flew kind of all over the place. I know it's a little bit hard to see because California is quite big. Um, but there's a whole series of flight lines that happen kind of in a crosshatch pattern across the state. And um, they did, they flew these flight lines over the course of a couple of years during the California drought. And so what they wanted to do was to understand the way that the trees in the whole state were responding um, to, to the ongoing drought. Um, <coughs> and kind of what their health status might be at a given moment in time. Um, and so the idea was to then use satellite data, which is spatially extensive, um, in order to kind of estimate an upscale canopy water content. So to give you kind of a, a diagram that may or may not be helpful, um, I mean, it, it's helpful. Sorry. It's helpful if I can explain it well. Let me, let's put it that way. Um, <laughs> Um, so you would have, you know, this is an example of a series of um, kind of contiguous satellite data sets that you might have. So you have, um, you know, elevation and then some Landsat bands and then some perhaps elevation derived products, so things like slope. Um, and for a certain amount of area, you have your canopy water content um, that you actually got from your overflights. And you can average that up to be at the same resolution as the rest of these pixels. You can then um, kind of extract not only your, the pixel that you're trying to estimate, but the ones associated around it to help with kind of potential offset error and also the fact that a lot of these things have a kind of um, dynamic component where the, the spatial context does matter. Um, feed that into a deep learning model, um, and then use that to estimate canopy water content in places where you don't have this airborne data. So expand that out across space. And what that ends up looking like is being able to estimate um, this canopy water content. Oops, it's only on my screen. There we go. Um, canopy water content for a particular um, time point all the way across the state. And while this is cool, there's a lot of reasons why this could be higher or lower in different places. You can have, you know, you have oaks, you have redwoods, you have all kinds of different types of trees across the state, um, which all, all have kind of different um, canopy water content depths, potentially. And so you want to also think, because we have um, a Landsat time series that we can draw on, um, actually able to do this for multiple time points and look at changes. And so this is the, basically the change in, um, no one can see the scale bar, but you can use your imagination, right? Like green is wetter, red is drier. Um, so this is the change in canopy water content from um, 2011 to 2013. And then we can basically play that out continuously all the way through 2017 and start to look at the spatial dynamics of either kind of um, drought, uh, trees that are suffering from drought and trees that are recovering from drought, where that's happening, um, so where things are kind of more resilient to drought, where they tend to res um, recover better, so we could start to ask those kinds of questions. Um, what year was the uh, flown? It was flown in a couple different years. So it was it, uh, was it the beginning and the end of the series? Or? It was, I believe, 2015, 16, and 17. Or, or 16 and 17. I can't remember if it was all three or if it was just two. Um, um, yeah. So, and that also helped because then they could, um, it's not just pulling from one lens at point and predicting to all lens at points. It's, there's, you know, they were trying to use multiple years of that lens at data to, to build their model so that it, they could <coughs> check it against each other. Um, Okay, 
in that case, I think now um, I'm generally done. I want to talk a little bit about the fact that there's hyperspectral satellites coming uh, as well. And so thinking about you know, how, how we can continue to use these data in a way that kind of prepare us for um, being able to make a variety of different types of inferences with these um, satellites that are coming online. Um, and I had like backup slides. I was like, we could talk more about biodiversity. No, we have no time for that because I'm long-winded. But, um, but yeah, so any more questions at this point? I guess we have yeah, yeah, questions. Yeah. Sorry. But, uh, uh, so uh, shadow, we're trying to mask those shadows. Do you guys consider uh, using multi-angular measurements when you fly for reflection? Is that too hard to do? Or um, for the AOP? So for the AOP measurements <laughs> of surface reflections, you. can you guys fly it in multi-angle? Or have you tried that? Or? So um, you mean fly from different directions? From different angles, yes. So, so take take one, one image, uh, one angle, and then just keep flying and then take one another angle. Well, so I mean, our, our lines are always north-south oriented. Um, and generally, although not always, adjacent lines are flown in different directions. So, because normally what we're doing is say we start on one end, we're flying north, we're taking a turn, and then flying oh, south, okay. we're taking a turn and flying north, and going across. It doesn't always work out that way, but for the most part, that's, yeah. yeah. Um, so, the is, do you have the is it the potential to look off Nader and not um, in this directly below the plane? Mm -hmm. yes. Yeah, so it's 34 degrees. Yeah. Um, So we're not just looking at, mm -hmm. at Nader, we're looking um, at 70 degrees off Nader to the side of the aircraft. Yeah. And I mean, and then generally when you kind of stitch them together, you make some decisions about what your mosaicing criteria are going to be. So like, at least in Crested Butte, we basically made that decision because based on um, based on the angle so that we were kind of taking basically always the more west side of the line because of the time of day we had to fly, which was a little bit earlier in the day, and so that like sun angle seemed to look better generally. But we kind of went through some decision making to decide on that because we wanted things to be kind of the most sunlit, kind of most directly sunlit in the way that they were being observed. I mean, We've also. Oh. I was just going to say our data takes in Nader mode. Yeah, yeah. So, so it's just just that for the mosaic. For the mosaic. Yeah. No, I was I was thinking of. That flies at different, different angles and gives you like a different, a different angles, products at different angles. Mm -hmm. So you can calculate through LDS or whatever thing you can do. Yeah, so I'll just as a side note here, mm -hmm. we've done three, what we call, this is not publicly available on data, three GRDF flights where we flew 20 lines in a slight, slightly different angle over the course of the visit. We've done that three times. You have data. Okay. Yeah. And just one thing more. Mm -hmm. So, so when you do so these these maps uh, on on on, on these scopes. Mm -hmm. uh, so the accuracy is very important, and in, in, in those type of maps. So to improve the accuracy, do you guys try to do you keep it pixel based accuracy, or you kind of uh, try to get those data so to reclassify it in different categories? So. Um, we've generally kept it as pixel based and then you know for it depends on then like an analysis you want to do so I've been interested in kind of geomorphic processes and how they influence canopy traits and so um, if I have some gradient that I'm interested in looking over I will kind of can delineate that and then take the average or you know and variance associated with the pixels within that area and look across the gradient that I'm interested in to see kind of how that systematically changes so I mean, I think generally there's an aggregation that happens, but depending on the question you're interested in or, or not, I guess. Yeah, but, yeah. That makes sense. Because it seems that it's very variable, too. Like mm -hmm. that when, you, when you try to make these models, there's a lot of landscape activity. And there's a tremendous amount of activity that you have to measure. I mean, it doesn't really make too much sense. But I've seen yeah, some yeah, I mean, that they just, they just reclassify and make different categories of um, something that's better sized. OK. Yeah, I think it just depends on your application, probably. And, um, 
Yeah, no, no, that's, <laughs> you can give it back to me. I feel fine with that. Um. <laughs>